Litany for Creation For the marvelous grace of your creation, we pour out our thanks to you, our God. We praise you, O Lord, for plants growing in earth and water, for life inhabiting lakes and seas, for life creeping in soils and land, for creatures living in wetlands and waters, for life flying above earth and sea, for animals dwelling in woods and fields. How many and wonderful are your works, our God! In wisdom you have made them all. But we confess, dear Lord, as creatures privileged with care and keeping of your creation, that we have abused your creation's gifts through arrogance, ignorance, and greed. We confess, Lord, that we are often unaware of how deeply we have hurt your good earth and its marvelous gifts. We confess that we are often unaware of how our abuse of creation has also been an abuse of ourselves. For our wrongs, Lord, we ask forgiveness. We offer our repentance. We promise to reverence your creation as a gracious gift entrusted to us by you, our God. We promise anew to be stewards and not pillagers of what you have entrusted to us. We offer our covenant with creation to pledge our commitment to care for your good earth. Creator God, you have given us every reason to learn and promote this wisdom of lives lived in harmony with creation. May you daily be present with us, gracing our service, our loving, our striving, through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Yeah. 
sharing the good news of your The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. O God, you form all humanity to bear your divine image, and you intend for everyone to live together in harmonious dignity. We pray for all people, whether ourselves or others, who suffer the cruelties of racial or ethnic prejudice. Grant your spirit of power to all who are oppressed. Give healing to victims of violence, protection to the vulnerable and abused, better housing and worthy employment to the mistreated, courage to the fearful, a remedy for rage, strength to parents and caregivers, and hope to children and youth. Purge the privilege of their sense of superiority and lead church and society to foster communities of equity and diversity. Through Jesus Christ, our loving Savior, amen. Psalm 33, verse 5. He loves justice and right, tzedakah and mishpat. The earth is full of kindness of the Lord. Psalm 85, verse 11. Kindness and truth shall meet, justice and peace shall kiss, tzedakah, shalom. Proverbs 21, verse 15. When justice is done, mishpat, it is a joy to the righteous, tzedakah, but dismay to evildoers. Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 17. Learn to do good. Make justice, mishpat, your aim. Redress the wronged. Hear the orphan's plea. Defend the widow. Zephaniah, chapter 2, verse 3. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the earth, who have observed this law, mishpat. Seek justice, sedeka. Seek humility. Amos, chapter 5. But let justice roll down like waters, Mishpat, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, Sedeka. Micah, chapter 6, verse 8. You have been told, O mortal, what is good, and what the Lord requires of you, only to do justice, Mishpat, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 4. Look at the proud. Their spirit is not right in them, but the righteous, Sedeka, live by their faith. Matthew 22, verses 35 through 40. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Luke 10, verses 25 through 37. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers, who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down the road, and, then he, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave him to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three, do you think, was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise.
Hello, people of God of the Northwest Synod of Wisconsin. Welcome to worship today. I am so grateful for this opportunity to worship with you and so grateful for your partnership in ministry. Thank you for all that you do to share the good news so that all will know the healing grace of God and the next generation will come to know and love Jesus. This sermon is an extension of our Synod Assembly theme, Jesus, Justice, and Joy. During our assembly, we will reflect on a scripture verse from Proverbs 21, verse 15. When justice is done, it is joy to the righteous. Let me say that again. Proverbs 21, verse 15. When justice is done, it is joy to the righteous. And we'll also reflect on a quote by the scholar Dr. Cornell West. Always remember, justice is what love looks like in public. Now I'd like to connect the dots between our baptismal call to do justice and the greatest commandment, to love God and to love neighbor. And to do that, I'll begin with a personal story. My granddaughter, Sonia K. Scow Anderson, was born during the pandemic on June 19, 2020. She was baptized on August 29th at an outdoor, socially distanced, masked worship service. And maybe it was because of the challenging circumstances of this past year, but I was particularly struck by the power and depth of the meaning of the words of the baptismal liturgy. During that service, her parents and godparents made promises that are made at every Lutheran baptism. They promised to bring her to worship and Holy Communion. They promised to teach her the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments. They promised to place in her hands the Bible. They promised to nurture her with prayer that she should come to faith and trust God and one day proclaim Christ through word and deed. They promised to teach her how to care for others and the world that God made, and they promised to help her work for justice and peace. Her parents and godparents promised, like so many others before them, to teach a tiny infant to care for others and the world God made and work for justice and peace. Holding my infant granddaughter, I asked myself the good Lutheran question, what does this mean? What does this mean for parents and godparents and grandparents? And what does it mean for congregations to faithfully promise to partner with parents to help them do this? And what does it mean for teenagers who affirm their baptism in the rite of confirmation? Hopefully, when my granddaughter Sonia Kay is confirmed in 13 or 14 years from now, she will make public confession of her faith. She will affirm her baptism as Lutheran confirmation students have done for generations, with these or very similar words. On her confirmation day, the pastor will ask her, do you intend to continue in the covenant God made with you in holy baptism, to hear the word and share in the Lord's Supper, to proclaim the good news of God and Christ through word and deed, and to serve all people following the example of Jesus, and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth? And she will, God willing, say, I do, and I ask God to help and guide me. For generations, parents and godparents have been asked to raise their child in the Christian faith, to raise children that care for the world that God made, and to raise children that will serve others and work for justice and peace in all the world. For generations, teenagers are confirmed by affirming their baptismal promises to serve all people and strive for justice and peace in all the earth. So here's the main point. This last year has been crazy, and everyone's a little anxious, and this has made some feel uncomfortable to talk about justice in the church. I hear you. It's been a challenging topic, and I feel uncomfortable about it too sometimes, and I understand. These days it's important to be clear. To talk about Jesus is to talk about justice. It is not a Republican or Democratic issue. It is a biblical and faithful conversation. Jesus is not about divisive partisan politics. Jesus came to break down the dividing walls. To be clear, I'm not here today to talk about party politics. Today I want us to remember our baptism and our confirmation promises. Working for justice is at the very core of our Lutheran identity, and this is nothing new, and this is not political. It is central to our life of faith. This baptismal covenant promise to care for others, to care for the world that God created, and to work for peace and justice is not politically motivated. It is at the very heart of who we are as baptized children of God. 
working for justice and peace, caring for creation, and serving others is as basic as baptism and as central as confirmation to our Lutheran faith. After the last year we've had with the COVID-19 pandemic, deep political division, racial protests, and the ongoing climate crisis, we are more aware today of our need to live out our baptismal promises to serve God, to serve God's people, and to work for justice and peace in all the earth. So what? So what does it mean to work for justice? What does the word justice mean anyway? Let's take a look at the word justice in the Hebrew Bible. There are three words in Hebrew that are translated in English as justice, and they each come at justice from a different angle. The Hebrew words are mishpat, tzedakah, and shalom. Let's examine each of them for a moment. First of all, mishpat. Mishpat means being in right relationship with God. God, God's judgment, God's law, God is a righteous God. Mishpat. The second word is tzedakah. It means being in right relationship with people, treating people fairly and justly, a right relationship with our neighbors. And third, shalom. Shalom means being in right relationship with all of creation, the wholeness and fullness of creation, the restoration of the whole creation. Now what do all three of these words for justice have in common? That's right, relationships. Justice has everything to do with being in right relationship. As Christian people, we are called to be in right relationship with God, with others, with our environment, and even with ourselves. Biblical justice and righteousness, mishpat, tzedakah, and shalom describe our calling as Christ followers. First of all, let's talk about mishpat, or justice. God is just, a right relationship with God. Martin Luther, as a young monk, struggled with his relationship with God. He was constantly worried about his sin, and he believed that his sinful thoughts and behaviors would block his path to salvation. Luther would often go to confession and would do other spiritual acts in an attempt to make his case before God, whom he believed to be the harshest of all judges. Young Luther was a tortured soul. He struggled to prove to God that he was righteous. Once when he was in Rome, he was performing a ritual act of praying while crawling up 28 sacred stair steps on his knees. Luther remembered at that moment the words of the prophet Habakkuk, the just shall live by faith. Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by faith. This revelation, this verse changed Luther's life and became the basis of the doctrine of justification by faith, the key doctrine of the Reformation. Friends, I can't emphasize this enough. This is the core of our Lutheran theology. Mishpat, justice, right relationship with God comes by faith. We are made right with God by faith, not by any spiritual, ritual act or good deed we might do to attempt to make up for our wrongs. We don't have to do anything except believe and have faith in God's grace and forgiveness that's made real to us in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We don't need to do anything because we believe in a God of love, and this is the good news, and this brings great joy. The Catholic theologian John Donahue wrote, Martin Luther wrestled with the problem of a just God and sinful creation through his study of scripture. He translated the God of justice into a God of love. And then Donahue writes, the task of our age may well be the reverse, to translate the love of God into the doing of justice. The task of our age is to translate the love of God into the doing of justice. So mishpat, justice, right relationship with God. Here's the question I want you to think about today. How do we translate the love of God into the doing of justice? Take that question back to your congregation and talk about it after worship or after your next council meeting. How do we translate the love of God into the doing of justice? The second Hebrew word for justice is tzedakah and it means being in right relationship with our neighbors. Luther's famously said, God doesn't need your good works, but your neighbor does. In Luke chapter 10, our gospel reading for today, we hear the story of the Good Samaritan. An expert of the law tests Jesus. 
Teacher, he asks, what much should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, what's written in the law? And the lawyer answers correctly, of course. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you've answered correctly. Do this and live. But, but, the lawyer wanted to justify himself. Wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who's my neighbor? Who exactly is my neighbor? Dear friends in Christ, who's your neighbor? In the story of the Good Samaritan, we learn that the robbers planned the attack and were waiting for unsuspecting travelers. Who's my neighbor? Our neighbor are travelers, those who are far from home. Our neighbor is everyone that's systemically abused. The robbers beat up the man on the road to Jericho. They hurt him physically and violently. Who's my neighbor? Every one of God's beloved children that is beaten down by injustice or every victim of violence is our neighbor. Who's my neighbor? Everyone who's hurting, whose health and well-being is threatened is my neighbor. Then we learn that the robbers stole his money. Who's my neighbor? The poor. Those who have no means to care for themselves. The hungry. They are our neighbors. It wasn't a fair fight on the road to Jericho. There were several robbers against one traveler. Who's my neighbor? Everyone who cannot defend themselves is our neighbor. Everyone whose cries for help is not heard by the powers that be is our neighbor. Jesus asked the lawyer, which one loved the neighbor? And the answer, well, it wasn't those who walked on the other side of the road, the ones afraid to get their hands dirty. They did not practice neighbor love. Rather, the hero of the story is the one who was different, the one that the lawyer despised, the one who was of a different religion, a different culture. It was a Samaritan, the one who showed mercy. The Samaritan was the one who went out of his way to show love to the neighbor, who cared for his wounds, who took him to a safe place. Who's our neighbor? Everyone who is of a different religion, ethnic origin, sexual orientation, everyone who speaks another language or is born with another color of skin, they are all our neighbor. The greatest commandment is the commandment to love. You shall love God and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. No exceptions, no limits. Dr. Cornell West tells us that justice is what love looks like in public. The Good Samaritan story is about justice and it is what love looks like in public. When we love our neighbors like the Samaritan did, we are doing justice, tzedakah. Zedekah is right relationship with other people, right relationship with our neighbor. Luther reminds us that God doesn't need our good works, but our neighbor does. So three words for justice in the Hebrew Bible, mishpat, zedekah, and finally shalom. Shalom, justice, or right relationship with all of creation. When I hear the word shalom, I think it means just peace, but really it means much more than that. It means being in right relationship with the whole and restored creation, to be at peace with all creation. Shalom is the peace that comes with justice. Justice in this deep and holistic sense is about restoring to community and putting things right, repairing and healing of relationships with each other and with creation. The greatest commandment is to love God and to love our neighbor. And in the broadest sense, our neighbor is all that God created. To care for creation is to care for our neighbor and the entire environment that affects our neighbor's life. Installing solar panels in our church, recycling, composting in our homes, reducing the use of plastic, it's all loving our neighbor. Justice is what love looks like in public. When we care for the environment, we're doing justice for the sake of all of God's creation. And that includes your neighbor and yourself, the forests, the lakes, and the rivers of the northwest Wisconsin, the rainforests in Brazil, the Pacific Ocean, the Alaskan wilderness, the California shoreline and forests, Lake Superior shores and the lands of the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. 
to love our neighbor is to love and care for the Great Barrier Reef near Australia, the deserts of Africa, the polar ice cap, the ozone layer of the atmosphere, the air we breathe, and the many people of every land who live in all of those places. They are all our neighbors. They are all part of God's good creation under our care. Mishpat, tzedakah, shalom. Friends, hold on to those words in the days and weeks ahead as you lead your congregations forward, taking the next faithful step in ministry, doing justice with joy for the sake of Jesus. Our baptismal call is to follow the example of Jesus, to care for the world God created, to serve all people, and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. The work of justice is God's work. You know, God's work, our hands. God's work, our hands. God's work of justice is done with our hands and our feet and our voices. The work of justice is God's work that's done with our lives. Justice is what love looks like in public. Working for justice and peace is as basic as baptism and as central as confirmation for Lutherans. Thanks be to God. Amen. Refugees abroad, 
Christ became our doorway to the reign of God. So must our tables welcome those who roam. None can be excluded, all must find a We're here today at Our Savior's Lutheran Church in Menominee, Wisconsin. I'd like to invite you now to affirm your baptism. People of God, today I ask you, do you intend to continue in the covenant God made with you in baptism to serve all people following the example of Jesus and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth? If so, answer I do and I ask God to help me. Now I ask you to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God? If so, answer, I renounce them. Do you renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God? If so, say, I renounce them. Do you renounce the ways that sin draws you from God? If so, answer, I renounce them. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You have made public profession of your faith. Do you intend to continue in the covenant God made with you in holy baptism, to live among God's faithful people, to hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper, to proclaim the good news of God in Christ through word and deed, to serve all people, following the example of Jesus, and strive for justice and peace in all the earth? If so, answer, I do, and I ask God to help and guide me. People of God, do you promise to support each other and pray for each other in our life together in Christ? If so, answer, we do, and we ask God to help and guide us. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, that through water and the Holy Spirit you give us new birth, cleanse us from sin, and raise us to eternal life. Stir up in us the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. Together we rejoice in the life of baptism, Together, we have given voice to our commitment to live a Christian life and intend to do what we can to serve others, care for creation, and bring about a just and peaceful world. I thank God for the partnership we share in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. Everything I see, the earth, the sky, the sea, are gifts of God to me. And I believe God's greatest gift is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was God's only son who came to earth to be my friend and sibling. Jesus was born in Bethlehem long, long ago. He was born of the Holy Spirit and Mary was his mother long, long ago. Jesus was very good and even so he was put to death, crucified by Pontius Pilate, a powerful Roman judge. 
All seemed lost when Jesus was buried in the tomb, but it wasn't. I believe God raised Jesus from the dead. On Easter Sunday, his friends saw him alive, and all his friends rejoiced and sang, Alleluia. Yes, the Holy Spirit gives life to me too, and not only to me, but to all the friends of Jesus who are his church. God forgives our sins and gives us hope of life forever. Amen. Unifying God, you bring us together as a church, calling us to be an instrument of your work. Guide us by your word and teach us to be the hands and feet of Jesus, God of justice. Hear our prayer. Out of the void, you shape the universe and we are surrounded by your beauty and abundance. We are grateful for your love and goodness. Help us to care for your creations with the same generosity you have shown to us. God of justice, hear our prayer. We pray for the sick, poor, grieving, those who are oppressed or have been victims of violence, or anyone else who is suffering or in need, that we lift up aloud or silently at this time. God of justice, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we give thanks for the arrival of spring and for the gifts of friends and family, for wisdom and for new beginnings that remind us that we are Easter people celebrating the resurrection and new life of Jesus Christ. God of justice, hear our prayer. Into your wide embrace, O God, we place our prayers, trusting that you will receive them into your heart of mercy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
We thank you, O oh God, for sharing this meal with us. Shine the light of Christ on our path, that we may do justice, love, kindness, and walk humbly with you now and forever. Amen. May the shalom of God inspire your heart and mind through Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, yeah,